Great. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning, this evening. Uh, my name is Karen Dyson. I'm one of the authors um, for Chapter F2.0, and my one of my co-authors is also in chat, um, Andrea, and she can also help with questions. Um, we're going to touch on three main points, the chapter overview, a little bit of the theory behind the chapter, um, and then we'll walk through the practicum. The slides have in them um, a link to the slides. Yeah, this, um, and let's just go ahead and get started. So for this chapter, um, the main goal is to introduce you um, how to combine and manipulate image bands uh, in order to highlight information pertinent to your research. Um, and so this includes, as Jeff was saying, um, the some basic indices uh, and some addition and subtraction, uh, basic um, mathematical operations, um, as well as masking, thresholding. Um, and at the end, you should be able to take an image and transform it. So two of the learning outcomes are first, understand what spectral indices are and why they're useful, um, and then also introduce a range of spectral indices. And this chapter assumes that you know how to import images and image collections, as well as filter and visualize them. All of this is covered in F1. So um, if you recall the last two weeks, um, we talked about image collections in Earth Engine, um, and these organize many different images, such as many pictures that have been taken from a single satellite into one larger data storage structure. Um, and so last week we talked about how there were many different types of satellite imagery available, but not every data set is appropriate for every analysis. So we talked about some of the um, things to consider when choosing one, including spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. And so this week, we're gonna talk about spectral indices um, as well as some other uh, thresholding and manipulation. Um, and kind of the, the key takeaway, as I was mentioning, is this is kind of that first step into taking um, the satellite data and transforming it into things for your use. Um, so spectral indices, uh, basically the main idea as to why these are useful is that different objects and different land covers on Earth's surface reflect different amounts of light from the sun. So if you recall basic, you know, very, very simplified um, uh, a satellite is essentially a, a, a type of camera. So it's looking at not all of them, but many of them are looking at reflected electromagnetic, usually light of some sort um, that is reflected off the Earth's surface and capturing that. And that capture is really what we're what we're analyzing. So we have to think about how different surfaces are reflecting that light in order to do analyses such as land use and land cover, um, detecting where forests are, detecting if there's missing forest, um, you know, looking to see where buildings are, things like this. So spectral indices help us by combining multiple bands, so multiple wavelengths, um, often using simple operations like subtraction and division, in order to express how objects reflect light across multiple portions of the spectrum. Um, and this single value across an entire image helps to distinguish these particular land uses or land covers of interest. So I've included on this slide um, an example uh, graph that shows how some different land covers um, reflect different wavelengths. So if you look at um, if you look at snow, for example, it reflects a lot in these lower wavelengths and almost none in the higher wavelengths. Um, whereas, for example, um, seawater reflects very little across all of the spectrum. 
So using these properties, we can help distinguish these different land covers. So let's move on to the practicum. Um, and before we dive in, um, I'm going to have two quick reminders. Uh, the first is that access to the book scripts in GEE, this link is the same link that's in the book everywhere. Um, when you click on it, you should see uh, under owner this project's GEE book. If you do not see this, simply hit this refresh button um, and it will show up. The second piece I want to uh, talk about quickly is finding help for functions in Google Earth Engine. Um, this week we'll start to get into using multiple functions, chaining functions. Um, and so I just wanted to mention this before we get too far into it. There's three, I'll call them three key ways uh, that you can find more information either about a function that you're using based on something in this book, or alternatively, something that you know you want to do, but you don't know the right function for it. Um, these are really common problems uh, across all sorts of programming. Um, and so the ways that we approach them in Google Earth Engine are first, there's a docs tab. Um, so in that same window that you have your scripts, docs, and assets, um, if you go to the docs tab, um, actually, can you see my earth engine window if I do this? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here, this middle docs tab, if you type something in like add, um, it will pull up all the functions that have that search term in it. So that's the first way. Um, the second way is there's a, a question mark um, that leads to a user guide and other sorts of guides. And that's up here. So where your name is, you can just click on this question mark and click on the user guide. And it will pop up in a new window for you. Um, and this has a whole bunch of information you can either search for the type of information you want, or the thing I find really helpful is under this guides tab, there's a whole bunch of information um, and a bunch of different tutorials that are all listed for you on this left-hand side. Um, and they will give you all sorts of information, including very basic information, such as pointing out what each of these things are called. <laughs> um, and I will note that in the book, we tried to use this terminology as much as possible, so it's consistent. So, and then of course the final option is Stack Exchange and Google. <laughs> All right, so um, let's chat about section one, um, which is band arithmetic in Earth Engine. So many indices, as I was mentioning, are calculated using very simple um, arithmetic addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And so you can calculate many indices just using these very simple um, arithmetic functions. So we will use two methods for this. The first is manual. So using add, subtract, multiply, divide. And then the second is, I'll call it functionalized. Um, so it that will use a function called normalized difference that executes a specific formula on your X, right? So th this is kind of, um, if you remember algebra and you had, you know, uh, X squared plus Y squared, and then you specify X and Y and plug them into that equation. That's exactly how this works. So let's go ahead and bring this code editor back. I don't know why, but it likes to move these little side windows around, but you at least can see how they can move uh, and hide themselves. Um, and so if you ever lose them, if you can't find your console, you just have to pull it back open. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and run this 2.0a checkpoint, and then we'll talk about it. 
So give that a second to load. All right, we'll go ahead and um, turn a couple of those off so we can walk through this script. So um, as we've seen in other uh, lessons, other chapters, this first part uh, imports and filters the imagery. So it says, give me these images in this location. It then displays that image using a false color composite. So that's one of the things I think we talked about two weeks ago. And then this next piece is where we start to get into the new functions and the new um, aspects that we're talking about this week. So we're first pulling out two bands from our image. Um, and it happens to be the near infrared and the red bands. And we're assigning those to variable names. And this is really for ease of use. You can just call these, um, you know, you can select these band names in other ways. Um, I find it very helpful to assign them variable names just because it makes your code more human readable. Uh, uh, Google Earth Engine, of course, like many programming languages, will take many different types of input. Um, but, you know, for ease of reading <laughs> kindness to yourself uh, six months in the future when you're trying to remember what your code does, uh, as well as for other people to read your code so you can share it, which is one of the major strengths of Earth Engine, um, as well as for a host of other reasons. I highly recommend uh, this approach that we've used, which is to name your variables with something intelligible. So we have NIR, so for near infrared and red, and we're now going to calculate the numerator and the denominator uh, for an index called NDVI. And NDVI is essentially near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red. Um, and what this index, once it's calculated, does for us is highlight some different types of vegetation. So uh, NDVI um, is extremely useful for doing things like um, forest cover, looking at changes in forest cover, uh, things like this. There's also a number of other indices that we can use that we'll actually talk about, I think, in about a month. Jeff can go ahead and correct me on that. <laughs> um, but NDVI is a very simple one to calculate. It's extremely useful. It's very powerful um, and so very commonly used. So to calculate that numerator, uh, we use the, we call the near infrared variable, and then we use the subtract function to subtract the red. Uh, same thing for the denominator. And then to go ahead and calculate NDVI itself, we simply use that same kind of syntax to say, please divide the numerator by the denominator. And then we can go ahead and map that. And when you see that with the, it's called NDVI manual in the uh, code checkpoint that we've written for you, you can go ahead and see that this is San Francisco. And you can go ahead and see that those areas that are extremely red in the false color, which means high amounts of vegetation, are then very green uh, in our color scheme, which is high values of NDVI. So low values of NDVI include things like water, asphalt, um, and uh, other human infrastructure, um, things with high values uh, include more vegetation. So, um, and you, on your own time, I highly encourage you if you're, um, if you want to better understand kind of how uh, Google Earth Engine is doing this, you can also individually map the different pieces, for example, the numerator or the denominator or just the near infrared or just the red and kind of build it up that way. 
um, but in the interest of time, we will not be doing that. So as I mentioned, there's also, I'll call it a functionalized way of doing this, which is the normalized difference function. So this is really easy. Um, instead of having to do all of the um, all of the individual calculations, we just have to remember near infrared is B band eight, red is band four. And so we can just call from the image normalize difference on band eight, that near infrared, and band four, the red. And then when we map that, you can actually see it gives us the exact same result. So you will not see the by design NDVI for normalized difference and NDVI calculated in manual way should be exactly the same. Um, and if you'd like to explore that more, I highly recommend using the um, Google Earth Engine has a very convenient um, uh, transparency slider that is very useful for that. So now that we've seen this function, we can also use it to calculate a whole number, a, a very large number of different types of indices um, that use the same type of formula, i.e. a normalized difference, which is blank minus blank divided by blank plus blank. So um, NDWI is another such index that is calculated using this approach. And so it uses uh, bands eight and 11, um, which is, I believe, near infrared and shortwave infrared. Um, and uh, we can go ahead and calculate this using the exact same approach. So because band eight is in the first slot and band 11 is in the second slot, for that equation, remember when we plug and chug, <laughs> um, it's going to be band eight minus band 11 divided by band eight plus band 11. So very straightforward. And if we go ahead and turn on that layer, we can go ahead and see that, that this index um, is great at kind of pulling out wet things. So that's what it's used for. Um, all right, so section two of this chapter talks about thresholding, masking, and remapping images. And these are three related functions, I'll say. Um, and so I'm actually going to go through all three of them instead of pausing between each one because it's all part of one section. Um, and we'll go ahead and um, Hopefully by doing it this way, uh, we'll probably answer some of your questions that come up as we go along. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So the first piece of this section is thresholding. And this is a pretty simple idea. It's basically using logical in operators in order to categorize band or index values into two groups. So this uses Boolean operators. Um, so Boolean is basically true, false, one, zero. Um, and operators in Google Earth Engine um, are basically the same as ever, anywhere, but they do have a somewhat unique um, taxonomy, shall we say. So I've listed them out here. Uh, they're usually two to three letters um, and they're essentially just abbreviations, the first letter um, of what you would kind of call them mathematically. So for example, uh, less than or equal to is LTE. So less than equal. Um, and that's kind of how I have to remember uh, what they all are. <laughs> um, but again, remember that if you ever have trouble, you know, Oh, what is it? What is the abbreviation for less than or equal to? Um, you can always um, type it into either the docs or the um, uh, user help that we were talking about before. So um, let's go ahead and pull up this checkpoint. 
up. And I'm going to go ahead and as we did before, run this and then talk through different pieces. So this will take a second to load um, and it will actually load all of the different pieces that we don't need quite yet. So um, as before, we start by selecting um, an image, uh, create the NDVI using the normalized difference approach that we just talked about um, and then mapping it. So um, here's the NDVI for Seattle. Uh, we've got it on that same red um, to green color palette that we did before. So now we're going to take this NDVI and implement a threshold on it. So using kind of that same approach as we saw with the add and subtract, um, as well as the divide previously, uh, we say, you know, the Seattle NDVI greater than 0.5. We're going to assign to our new variable, which is CVEG, Seattle vegetation. <laughs> um, and I'm going to go ahead and make this. There we go. Um, so if we go ahead and map this threshold, um, Essentially, what we've done by thresholding this is, again, using that Boolean operator into kind of true and false or in group, out group, you know, however you want to define it. Um, by saying everything greater than 0.5 is one, so it's true. Um, this is basically turning it into a forest, non forest. So where our non-forest is zero and our forest, i.e. places with NDVI greater than 0.5, i.e. things that are likely vegetation, um, it, it's a you know pretty quick and dirty forest, non-forest mask. So if we go ahead and turn that layer on, um, we can see the palette here. Uh, there's no gradient in it, which is kind of the first um, thing to look at in noticing that it's now a categorical variable. So, I mean, technically a Boolean variable, but categorical. There's two bins that everything falls in. There's no in-between, like we saw with the NDVI, where it span that color palette. So, um, and I'm actually going to switch back to the slides now. Um, Along with thresholding, uh, so we just saw how to do it for two categories, but sometimes you might want to bin things into more than two categories. So for this, um, we use where. Um, and we can use where to build these complex categorizations, i.e. more than two categories. And this uses we again are using Boolean operators to assign new values. Um, and we're going to use kind of a, I'll call it a shortcut. Um, we're actually going to start with an image where every value across the image is one. And then we're going to say, okay, in this image, the pieces where NDVI in this other layer is less than negative 0 0.1, make it zero. And then for NDVI greater than 0 0.5, give it a value of two. So our end map should have values of zero, one, and two. Alternatively, and we won't get into this today, um, but you can use other operators such as and and or to specify multiple conditions that can be met. And this is talked about in the text. So I'm gonna go ahead and oh, bring back our Google Earth Engine window and talk about how we implement the where. Um, and I do see some questions popping up in chat and Andrea, maybe you could address these. Um, that would be a big help, thanks. Um, so we can keep moving here. So for our implementation of the where function, 
uh, again, like I said, we're going to start with a image where everything is a value of one. So this is how we do that. We basically say, create an image of one. That's what this first command is here. And then we use clip to constrain the size of the new image. So it's not the entire world. We're actually just, we just wanted the same geometry as our other image. So we clip using the Seattle and DVI geometry. So then we get um, a layer that is the same footprint and every pixel has is the same size and every pixel has a value of one. Um, and I will say, we're not gonna dive too far into clip and geometry in this lesson. Um, we do in other ones, uh, but if you're curious, I highly recommend you um, again, look at those great resources uh, that Earth Engine has available. Um, and you can also uh, look in the book because uh, other chapters and other authors will do talk about this in more detail. Um, so again, um, this is our first use of where. Uh, so using that image that has a value of one everywhere, we can say, in this image, where the Seattle NDVI layer is less than or equal to negative 0.1, assign the value zero. So that's what we see here. So the where has two arguments. The first is the Boolean uh, operator. Um, and then the second is the value to assign. And then we repeat that process. Like I said, with places where NDVI is greater than uh, 0 0.5 and assign those to the value of two. And then we can say, okay, we can now map this layer. And remember, this is now a categorical image and we have three values, zero, one, and two. So our minimum value is gonna be zero. Our maximum value is two. And we want a palette of blue, white, and green because that will basically be, since we've assigned three colors, it will give each category one of those colors. So um, blue areas are going to have value zero, um, or I guess I should say it the other way around. <laughs> Places where the value is zero will be blue, one, white, and two, green. Um, and so this is, uh, essentially a water, non-forest, and forest map. So if we go ahead and turn that on, you can see that it's very similar to the forest, non-forest, except we've now added this third category, uh, which is water. So now let's pop back um, and we'll talk about masking, which again, uses these uh uses a lot of the same ideas it uses the same kind of boolean operators um and you'll notice that that's a theme here so masking basically removes specific areas of the image um so that they are not for example included in an analysis this is really important um and one of the reasons we're teaching it to now is this is really important moving forward uh, because constraining your analysis in this way um, means that, for example, you're not analyzing portions of the map that you don't want to for any number of reasons. Um, they're outside your area of interest. They are, um, you know, if you include those in the analysis, you're going to get spurious results, things like that. Um, it can also help. Um, well, it also helps with more advanced things such as cloud masking, which again, we'll talk about, I believe in F4.6. So, um, so again, your unwanted areas for analysis will get a value of zero um, and your unmasked areas will have a value of one in the mask layer. Um, so you don't have uh, multiple values. It's basically that true false but you can assign different things to the masked area versus the unmasked area. So for masking in Earth Engine, um, we use 
the mask function to set an image's mask. And then we use the update mask function to add values to an existing mask. So let's go ahead and see how this works. So to implement masking, um, the first thing that you can always do if you'd like um, is to look at a, a, a layer's existing mask. Um, so the way you can do this is by using the add layer, uh, the same add layer map add layer function. Sorry, that's mouthful. Um, that we've been using uh, previously throughout this lesson and through previous lessons um, to say, please map this uh, the you know this layer's mask, um, and then that's what we see when we can turn on the Seattle vegetation mask. And what we see here is very simple, right? So again, black is zero, white is one black is masked, white is unmasked. So we see a very simple thing where the entire world, actually we'll go ahead and turn off these old layers. Um, the entire world is masked except for this one area, which is what we would expect, right? Because this layer only has data in this location, it's showing data in this location and nowhere else. So we're now gonna create a binary mask of non-forest areas. So we're going to create a new um, a new mask and say for our uh, Seattle vegetation map that we created before, anywhere where it's equal to one. And then um, we can update visitors today, um, we can update that Seattle vegetation mask with the non-forest mask. So with these with these um, non-vegetated areas that we've just assigned to the veg mask variable. So we do this again using the update mask function. And this is the same kind of syntax to update the Seattle vegetation mask with the non-forest mask, we simply say Seattle vegetation, update the mask with the vegetation mask. And now we can map this updated vegetation layer. Um, actually, I'll turn this off. And this is the masked forest layer. And if you see now, and I want to point out the difference between this mask layer and the non-forest versus forest layer. The easiest way to do this is to look at one of these non-forested areas. So in the non-forest versus forest layer that we created using that first instance of the Boolean operator, areas that are white have a value of one, or sorry, of zero, I think we send them, and areas that are forested above that 0.5 value have a value of one and they're green. So there's data, right? There's values across the entire thing. However, if we look at the masked forest layer, you can see how you can see the base map coming through. That's because there's actually no data in those masked areas. So this is extremely valuable, right? Because the only place you have data now is where we had decided those forested areas were. So masks are an extremely powerful tool. Um, I will also mention they are not always easy or immediately applicable um, for some more basic analyses. Um, and so if you don't if you end up coming back to this material, um, you know, in a little while when you have seen, for example, the information on cloud masking, I'd say that's just fine. This is, you know, helping to build those, helping to build those fundamentals. So 
Um, we can also see, again, this updated mask that we can see in the, in the actual layer. And we can see how those values compare to the original mask that we saw. So remember before, before we updated the mask with the non-forest areas, right? Before we added those non-forest areas to the mask, i.e. get them out of the analysis, um, we had just one white square. We now have a modified area. So the only areas that are white are those forested areas. So this is a great, again, a great approach. When in doubt, map it. So you can see uh, what your code is doing. All right. So now for the last piece, remapping. And this is a very, a much more simple idea, idea kind of, than the masking, which I'll definitely say is the hardest part of, I'd say, this entire chapter. Um, the remapping is basically, it takes specific values in an image and it assigns them to a different value. So we use remap for this. Um, and what we'll do is go back to that previous layer that we created uh, of the Seattle where using that where function. So we have that water, non-forest and forested areas. And um, remember before we assign those values zero, one, and two we can arbitrarily reassign those to any values we want. So using remap, we'll make the value of 0, 9, the value of 1, 11, and the value of 2, 10. And 9, 11, and 10 have absolutely no theoretical meaning. They are just values that we chose in order to illustrate uh, the remapping function. And so when we do this, uh, after we after we do this and explore it, you'll be able to use the inspector uh, in order to view this. So let's go ahead and switch back to our code checkpoint. I'm going to pull out our inspector because we'll need that. So the last piece of this section um, is for us to implement remapping. And so as we just discussed, we will, to create the Seattle remap layer, we will use the Seattle where layer. Again, that water, um, let's go ahead and pull it up. The water, forest, and non-forest that we created previously. And we're simply going to remap these values. So the remap, asks you to put in the existing values, and then you put in the remapped values, and it will remap anywhere it finds zero, it will remap it to the, you know, uh, I guess, let me explain it instead this way. Anytime it sees a value in that first spot, it will remap it to the value in the first spot of the array for the remapped values. So here, it sees anything that's a zero and it looks and says, okay, what's the first value in, this, in the remap array? And it says nine. So anything that's zero becomes nine. Anything that's one becomes 11. Anything that's two becomes 10. And you can, re you can replace these values with anything you want, right? So again, they're not theoretically relevant. Uh, they're just used here for illustration purposes. So after that remap function executes, we can see the results of this uh, by mapping this new remapped layer, <laughs> saying the word map a lot. Um, so again, though, when we think about it, the if we want the colors to be the same, and this is used in, as, as an example so that you can see how um, even though the values have changed, they will still map sequentially. So Google Earth Engine will 
look at your palette and put the first color for the first category, the second color for the second category, the third, third color for the third category, kind of regardless of uh, what you think the order should be. Um, so you have to make sure that those are the same. So if we want the same color palette, that is blue for water, white for the um, non-forested areas and green for the forested areas, we have to actually change the order of the palette. Because remember again, we now have the value of 11 uh, for one and the value of 10 for two. So those have switched positions essentially. Um, so we need to switch the position of the palette colors. Um, and so this code will do that. And you can see the green and the white have switched places. And if we go ahead and turn down that remap value layer, you can see that there's been no change. So we have successfully done this. If instead um, these were in the same order, you would see that the forested areas are white and the non-forested areas are green. But we can also use the inspector tool to verify that our changes have occurred. And so if I you know, click in one of these forested areas, originally that was a value of two. So if we see our water non-forest forest, it has constant value of two. And in our remapped values image, it has a value of 10. So perfect. That's just what we wanted to see. You can do this anywhere else. And you can actually also use the inspector to verify, going back to a, the first piece of this chapter with the Boolean values or Boolean operators, that the Boolean operators have worked properly uh, because, for example, if we click on an area of water, you can see that the NDVI, that original NDVI image that we calculated using the normalized difference, has a value of negative 0 0.3. So again, because that was less than negative 0 0.1, it got assigned to that value of 0. So the inspector is a great tool for verifying that your operations are doing what you want them to. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and we will turn it over for questions.